Let's do it. We are here. Rather have the story with our special guest today, Steve Porcaro. Steve is a good friend, and I think we're going to subtitle this Two Knobs. <laughs> kind of in... Watch your language. A theme. <laughs> yeah. All righty. Um, speaking of which, there's this monster behind us that I brought in today specifically for your interview. Seems Thank kind you. of appropriate. Sure. This is uh, an original Moog synthesizer dating back to the 60s and early 70s, and it is definitely old technology. Wow. It's as valid today almost as any other synth we've got. You know, anything we could play now is rivaled by the quality of some of the old stuff. Sure. And you went through that whole period of having a lot of interesting equipment, but I'm going to throw you a loop. What is a micro composer? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Good question. No, I, uh, um, my very, very first synth rig I ever got, a friend of mine in high school, Jay Chernick, had a mini Moog. He had um, serial number five, uh, Oberheim DS2, a digital sequencer. And he had like serial number 15 Oberheim uh, synthesizer expander module. Early stuff. Very early stuff. And he would just had all these chords and he would send the, you know, the Moog would go back and forth from the sequencer and then he could send something to the, the expander module. And, and, um, and I wound up buying, once I got my first gig at 17 years old with Gary Wright, I, my brother Mike fronted me the money to just buy this friend of mine's rig. He wanted to buy kind. Yeah, he wanted to buy a grand piano and wanted to get rid of all his stuff. Oh. And uh, and I loved it. And I used that sequencer quite a bit in the studio. I had learned arranging, so I was into not just arpeggiating and making things go fast, but I used to like to to write out stuff and have my fast thirty second note lines go through chord changes cool. and all that kind of thing. And uh, um, I, lo and behold, I see several years later, I see Roland coming out with this micro composer, eight channels of a digital sequencer. Mm. And I'm, again, having taken arranging lessons and having learned how to block harmonize, I pictured my flutes in five part block harmony. Or Bach chorale or something. Exactly, exactly. And every time I was studying, I whatever I was studying, whether it was trying to learn how to write for strings or trying to learn how to improvise, I thought these things could be my one-man band. Mm. This could, you know, put in a walking bass line, put in something comping, and then I could be free to practice and slow things down. And uh, I really saw a lot of value in that. Or, you know, like I said, learning to write for strings. Uh, what better way to experiment than to have these tools? That's how I saw it. A sequencer um, in those days was a lot trickier than people consider one now. Well, the thing that was beautiful about the original Oberheim was how simple it was. You, you hit record, you just played whatever you wanted in at a, at a pretty steady pace for the most part, and uh, uh, you could play it back as fast as you want. And uh, the Oberheim was very user friendly. It had three banks, and I could do a thing where on the three separate banks, I would just load in three separate chords and by just hitting the play button, the, the play button on each bank immediately played from bar one. It right. was beautiful. It was very fast. Mm -hmm. There was no delay. I could put in these really fast arpeggios on three different chords and access them all yeah. randomly. Yeah. And whenever, whenever I wanted to, just hitting play. It didn't all have to work out. It didn't have to be, uh, uh, you, could re you could restart it by just hitting the play button over and over again. So. The interesting technology of that one, and mm -hmm. I used to have one of those tabletop boxes, mm -hmm. it does recording in real time, so whatever your tempo was, you play it in, yes. but then you had speed control, faster, or slower. Exactly. But you couldn't do any other adjustments. As you said, it was purely simple. No, it no, it, it had three buttons for transposing. Yeah, grab it and then play it back mm -hmm. was all it would do, and it would do a single track, and then you could push a button and have if you want a bridge or a chorus or a different sure. kind of pattern. But you couldn't even turn it off and keep that. Oh, no. Shut it off and it's all gone. Yeah. Shut it off, it's gone forever. My first ever synthesizer concert was a, a duo that toured America in colleges called Haynes and Ramey. Completely unknown to most people. 
But one guy had a percussion synthesizer, modified rhythm thing. The other guy played piano and maybe an organ and a synth or two. But I do remember him having that sequencer because he could put in a bass line, make an ostinato kind of loop of it, and then jam over the top. So it was a very live performer kind of thing. Yes, and if I you had going. balls, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because, again, you lose power. It's risky. It's, <laughs> it's a nightmare. But starting with this thing called the Micro Composer, this is Roland's box, tabletop. Yes. Not MIDI. No, no, CV and Gates. But it was, uh, um, it was eight channels. Now I'm picturing, uh, you know, me, I used to call it thumbing it. You know, I would thumb this thing. I would actually use my thumb and re-trigger it mm. and it would reset. I'm picturing me do this, doing what I do with my micro composer times eight, you know. Yeah. Um, first thing, uh, the first stumbling block was you needed eight synthesizers. Tricky. <laughs> you need to come up with eight synthesizers, which wasn't easy. That's why they made little boxes like that expander, because it's a yes. synthesizer without a keyboard. Without, yes. And yes. you could buy all kinds of, sometimes a, a cheaper synth just for the bass, maybe. Yes, that would be the perfect solution, would be to have eight of those, mm. those Oberheim uh, expander modules, because they were a complete synthesizer, uh, not necessarily with a keyboard. Uh, that would have been perfect. Um, it just was a, it was a completely different beast than I thought it was. And I struggled with it. I struggled with it. I sat there with the manual and uh, I'd gotten a big modular system. Roger Lynn helped me design a, a modular system that was essentially eight mini Moogs mm -hmm. to go along with my micro composer. And uh, um, I was learning it all at once. And I sat there with the manual this horrible manual that was you know what i mean that had been translated from japanese to english, english to japanese to english and and uh it was a nightmare i remember at one point it saying um if it still isn't working or w whatever it said he said you should pack it up and bring it to the you know factory authorized service center and uh and i sat there for three days going i know this isn't broken and wow. i kept trying I kept trying and kept trying to recreate it, and I'd get stuck every time. And just I finally, after three days, for the hell of it, just out of frustration, I turned the page, and the first word was, unless. Mm. Oh, nice. <laughs> it, was, it was that kind of experience. That's the secret uh, key to getting something out yeah. of it. You know, I never really used it to its potential. It did all this amazing stuff. You could load it in live. I never loaded it in, uh, played into it. I learn to you know you would have to program three numbers to make a note now you explain know. what those there's the parameters first note is going to be the pitch the pitch the second note is going to be the step time the time when it between starts. notes yeah uh the third number was going to be the gate time how long how long on? was it held down for so i mean you're really almost like sheet music putting in quarter note on f sharp for you know oh this yeah long at this oh point. yeah tricky yeah it was very tricky but uh, I loved it. I, I loved it because it did whatever I wanted it to do. And um, I'd been doing a lot of uh, sessions in those days with David Foster, uh, the producer. And anyway, on my, I was like on year two struggling with this thing and we're, you know, working with it, doing the best I could. And David calls me out of the blue and he says, he goes, you've never heard of a micro composer, have you? I said, I've been killing myself on this mm -hmm. thing for the last couple of years. Well, his friend from Canada, he said, "Can I, I got a friend I want to bring over. And it was this guy, Ralph Dyke, who ah. did the original design of the micro composer for Roland, mm -hmm. for Mr. Kakahashi. And him and I became very fast friends. And uh, he was amazing. Ralph was just... Uh, Ralph is even credited on Total Records. Oh, yeah, for yeah. good reason. Because yeah. he, he made this stuff work. Mm. Ralph actually wound up making me a sync box. He, he, uh, um, I was in a band uh, uh, where the drummer did, would not play to a click under any circumstances. <laughs> okay. And here I am trying to blaze these trails. And, uh, that play... To a you know, and I don't blame my brother for not. You know, my brother was a world-class drummer and uh, had this Going amazing feel. pocket and feel, and and uh, they didn't want to play to clicks in those days. And uh, so Ralph actually, he had a, a mathematician friend. He they figured out this algorithm, and I had a live sync box. It actually also had a tape mode, but I could live tap along with a track, and it would spit out FSK 
frequency shift keying, mm -hmm. which is what all the drum machines and early uh, sequencers used. This is you the know, hard way to do things. Really hard way to do things. But, it's almost uh, like Disney animation, where they paint a picture, and then you move to the next cell, and you paint a picture, yeah, and you move to the next cell. Yeah. Obviously, some of that art still holds up, though. Yeah. I mean, this was, I became kind of embarrassed how much time I was spending on, on such non-musical stuff, on how many hours were being spent on, on uh, being under the hood, so to speak. It's a, it's a fun challenge, and of course, it makes life today seem so simple. The same way we all don't have to go hunting for food. We run down to 7-Eleven or yes. the market and buy something. Yes. We're, it's hard for people to understand that just a short time ago, things were so difficult, like getting a good piano sound on oh. stage. Or getting a good string sound. The, yeah. I mean, that's part, and part of this is, is how I got to know synthesizers. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Uh, I used to collect... I still have them. Uh, Keyboard Magazine would, would come out with uh, string tone simulation mm -hmm. columns by Robert Moog, yeah, like amongst other that, pieces. Right? How to do the sound yeah. of an orchestra. I was, that's what I was asked to do on many sessions, was uh, come up with string sounds. And I became quite the student of taking analog synthesizers, uh, uh, Jupiters, CS80s, Moogs, ARPs, and trying to get the sound of a string. Uh, now, when samples all of a sudden came out, when Roland came out with their, I guess, whatever came out right before the 760s and all that. So S550s and, their, and S50s and little guys, yeah. I was all of a sudden done. That's all I was ever trying to do yeah. was to get those sounds. So all of a sudden... To be realistic. Exactly, as realistic as possible. Now, along the way, I came up with some cool things. I, I had... Uh, uh, my first emulator I had modified so that it had an envelope on it so I could shut off the looping so that all I got was the attack mm. right you it only had two seconds of sampling yeah I had this sample of a motorcycle revving and I would take my Jupiters I would take my other sense that sustained beautifully mm -hmm. as long as you wanted and uh, right the more we learned about sound the more we learned about instrument uh, simulation the more we learned about how important the attack was that was the real real mm -hmm. complex part of the sound and I would just put that motorcycle rev just at the very, very split second beginning. And then my Jupiters would kick in. Again, this is all pre-MIDI. I just had a whole bunch of wires for all mm -hmm. my uh, CV and gate, my analog interfaces. And um, I kind of saw by combining things, it really helped a whole lot. It's almost like a magic trick. You're trying to get someone to believe that it's horns, to believe sure. that it's strings. But it comes up with its own beauty in the failure, like a Mellotron, a string synthesizer. Sure. People love the sound of 80s string synthesizers for what they are. Now no yep. longer hoping to get a real orchestra, you want the Jupiter 8 sound or you want sure. those strings. Well, that's a lot of times has been the thing with what we do is that you write, you go past it, you perfect it, and uh, the things that were wrong about it you know, Roland, when they were doing in a, you know, that sine wave that, uh, uh, you know, is used for bass drums so, in so much of popular music, that was Became. a huge mistake. That was a huge, uh, uh, that sounded horrible to everyone's ears at the time, as far as if you're trying to simulate a bass drum. But all of a sudden, all of us started looking back going, wait a minute. It functions. In Hang on a second. You know, yeah. we used to have a saying in the band, get into the fact it's not happening. You know? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> um, but there's a topic, mm. indulging yourself mm -hmm. versus getting the job done. We mentioned this quickly as like a band demand that you've had a couple of times. Get the job done. Sure. Versus going deep. Sure. Well, you know, studios would cost three to five hundred dollars an hour and uh, the clock's ticking. You're paying an engineer. Uh, um, uh, it was very much a high pressure environment and, uh, um, but in your session work, you were sure you were good at coming in and getting the job done, right? Sure. I, I, that's why I got hired. That's why any studio musician gets hired is because he's so good at delivering so fast. I was, I became very good at, at, at uh, um, you know, in a three hour session, we'd get two or three songs finished, the synthesizers, maybe a string arrangement, maybe a Moog bass part, 
some ornaments over here. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 we'd get a whole lot done. And um, when I'd get in the studio with my own band, they would kind of beg me to just do what you do for all these other producers, how efficient and how fast you could be. And for me, though, when it was my own record or, you know, if I was a part of the band, I wanted to experiment. I wanted to try some crazy stuff. I wanted to sit down and write out that string part. Mm. I didn't want to just kind of improvise it like I had to on a session. Sure, I could do that, but it wasn't as good when I got to write it out and think about it and write out the details and stuff. And it would always take a lot of time and it was very frustrating for my bandmates. But, uh, but if you, know, you look at the high points, the Rosanna solo, we all know, yeah. it's one of your compositions, right? Yes, that would have never, that's my perfect example of what would have never happened in a studio with the clock ticking, with five band members, you know, looking down my, looking over my shoulder. Uh, that took a lot of time. I wrote it out. I it's a little experimented. mini symphony. It's a, like a little yeah. mini composition. Yeah. And yeah. David was very, David Page was very involved in it, but I kind of had this concept for it, and, and uh, we got to do it. We got to finish it. Uh, the night before the song was mixed by Greg Ladani, it was all bounced down to two tracks. All the, all the, the, um, uh, Roland tape echo and and inside there all the stuff that if there was an engineer there at the time they'd say you know we're gonna do that on the mix you know what I mean do you remember I got to what's happening in those different layers do you remember oh what absolutely make them? absolutely because oh. David and I kind of the way the studio was set up at the time we kind of said to ourselves let's like go around the room hmm. let's go around the room uh, we knew when we wanted a Rick Wakeman Catherine of Aragon Mini Moog sound to kick in. After a, a sequence, this micro composer, it right. wasn't the first one, it was an MC4 at that point, but we wrote out, those are David's notes that I wrote out the three part harmony hmm. to these sine waves kind of going down, you know, cascading down. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that wasn't just. Not jamming. Uh, uh, winged while I was in the studio with the producer and the engineer and everyone sitting there. That was uh, a lot of trial and error. Yeah, even that little figure reminds me of the end of the piano solo in my life for the Beatles. George does a nice A major scale down. Mm -hmm. And it, again, it's not often that you get to fit something that busy into a pop song and make it work. I got, and I got lucky there. And I got to do it on a tune where my brother Jeff's playing this great drum part. And it was uh, a great song written by David Page. And, and everyone, everyone brought it. Yeah. I was thinking about doing a book called Studio Stories because there are so many good ones. Mm. You know, people having good days, bad days, mm. nightmares, all kinds of things. And there are so many good ones. But somebody filled me with two stories about Jeff, not too long, but also very interesting. And you can tell me if you might have heard. One was that he was doing a session, and he had some cigarette cellophane paper in mm. his hand. And he goes, watch this. And he would put it near the floor tom mic and crackle it. And the sound guy would, the engineer would go, what, what? I heard a noise, a crackle. And the guy would start soloing channels. Oh, I don't hear anything. They'd play, and then they would finish, and then he would reach over to the other Tom Tom mic and do it. And the guy would go crazy because it sounds like an electrical problem. And then he'd move it to another mic and do it there, driving the guy crazy the That's whole session. pretty fucked up. But not during the take, not during the take. It's funny, though. I remember Jeff would always point out he loved working with people. And sometimes it'd be someone new. Mm. And he would tell me what he dug about an arranger or a songwriter or a producer or an artist. He, he really respected guys who knew what they wanted. Um, you know, in the studio, for the most part, the most important thing was getting a drum track when you were doing a live, a live session. Yeah. That was the hardest thing. Was, and that was the one thing you wanted to make sure you had. Because then you can always overdub anything or punch in. You could and fix, fix ba a bass, a bad bass note, a bad. Everyone was usually isolated, and it was pretty easy to fix things. And and Jeff was just, uh, um, you know, he was a great leader in the studio that way, where he would kind of let you know when you had the track. You know what I mean? He would uh, uh, he would only want to exert so much energy. He didn't want to. He knew everyone would start losing it. You know what I mean? Uh, at a certain point. Those kind of musicians, it, it, it seems, me, I wish I could play things for a month. Half the time with Toto, I would figure out two months into a tour, I, I would constantly think, ah, this is what I should have done on the uh, record. Backward, yeah. Okay, 
But Lukather, David Hungate, David Page, my brother Jeff, these guys were amazing at playing something brand new and falling into a part, falling into these parts that was like they'd been playing these songs forever. They really had that gift. And uh, uh, Jeff was really, yeah, sometimes you might have to use some of that kind of bullshit like you're talking about <laughs> dealing with an inexperienced producer. But most of the time, he was just a real strong leader and, and wor loved working with great engineers and, uh, uh, you know, was very professional about showing up early all the time to get sounds. And uh, um, uh, he just, he was really, really good in the studio. There is a... Uh a time period when we were stretching the limits of tape. I'm surrounded by tape machines in this room, <laughs> uh, which is a, another thing of the past, but it's what we do here. And yet that was the time when you were trying to get more and more tracks to oh make boy. a record work. And you did use them. I mean, it's not like they were wasted. There's a lot of vocal parts, a lot of percussion. Oh, yeah. Layers of keyboards. Yes. It's a lot of work for an engineer producer to sort that out, for sure. Yep. Again, that's one of those things you look back, right? We, we gain, there's stuff we wouldn't imagine. Uh, you wouldn't imagine these days running out of tracks. Uh, uh, having more was always, was constantly everyone's desire was to have more. But uh, then once we had unlimited tracks, you start reminiscing about those times when there was just one track left for a guitar solo. And uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to... Keep that last one. That are you going to keep good? that last one? Are we going to punch in or right? You redo it. It's gone forever. And uh, just you saw the beauty of having to make those decisions. It was all about making those decisions. Um, now we, you know what I mean? Now we're able to put off those decisions uh, and have to sort through 16 guitar tracks mm -hmm. and maybe comp together the one. Uh, back then it was... Uh, it was what was great about it is uh, uh, we got stuff done. You know what I mean? It, you were able to get it done, and I was lucky enough to be surrounded by the kind of musicians who could who could rise to those occasions. Nobody wants to go backward too much. I find young people often look forward to going back to what the previous generation had. Mm -hmm. I did it going out and buying Mellotrons or old keyboards. Sure, I wanted what I couldn't get when I was younger, but I see people now have exploded with these tape machines. Have doubled and tripled in price in the last year or two because younger people, not older people, are going to it. Mm -hmm. And they want something about that. I'm curious whether it is a nostalgia or a myth or whether they do realize I don't want all the choices in the world. I don't know. I'm seeing a lot of what you're talking about. Even, okay, you can buy a brand new Moog modular uh, yeah. now. Um, but there will always be someone who will point out the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, they like that the oscillators were more unstable back in the day. Now, I, I spent half of my sessions were spent trying to get this stuff in tune. You know, yeah. uh, I kind of crack up at some of my plugins that have, uh, uh, you know, what is it on my ES2? What's it called? Uh, you know, it's just a general detune knob that kind of puts it out of tune with itself uh we were i can't tell you how many producers uh, uh were just trying and we were constantly trying to get things in tune trying to get synthesizers scaled even just yeah. a monophonic trying to get the octaves to be in tune mm -hmm. with themselves uh it could really be a challenge so i find that anything that passes audio anything yeah. uh my emulator twos with their 12-bit companding technology uh i mean yeah i kind of had built up a nice library but um i never saw any real good or anything special about them but yet if it's not made anymore if it passes audio there's somebody that's going to fetishize over this stuff true and have to have it and want it to be part of their collection and it yeah. does make sense that somebody is obsessed with drum machines or early samplers. That's the music they grew up with, and that's the, the field they want to stay in, whereas a modern classical composer may not be interested in early drum machines at all. Sure. So it's just picking the tools for what you want to do. Sure. But it's also good to be limited. Option anxiety is a huge, huge challenge. 
I think that's what you're talking about. Yeah, like the menu at Jerry's Deli was like 400 <laughs> things on there. And you're like, I don't even know. That's I want to exactly, have it all. <laughs> that's exactly what we're talking about. That's been a huge struggle for me. Um, yeah, and you try to come up with templates and you kind of come up with your favorite sounds and your favorite starting places anyway. but uh, And we're always trying to hear something that, that uh, excites us and hear something that hasn't been that we haven't heard before. Um, more about uh, uh, the way, using what we have, using what I have, uh, taking things, putting things in audio, uh, uh, recording things and manipulating the audio in a way I never had before. I mean, uh, uh, Hans Zimmer hit me to the zebra synth. There's always these great new things that I'm, I'm hearing stuff I haven't heard before. You know, some of us get real good at flopping over which side of our brain are we working on now. True. You know what I mean? Right. I had this great idea. I'm, I'm trying to come up with a part for this song and for, for this record. And, uh, uh, you know, you could be start off in a very creative mode, but then going down those rabbit holes, going through presets, thinking what if. Uh, uh, I mean, it's what we do for a living. You've got to be able to know when to flop back over be in creative mode and, and let those limitations uh, help you get done, you know. I'm uh, pleased to cover this stuff. It gets very technical, some of what we're saying, but I do think it's interesting. And I remember being inspired by probably your first time in Keyboard Magazine mm -hmm. was an article in an interview. And something stood out to me then for what I was interested in. You said, a mini Moog is cool, the jacks on the back are the interesting part. And nobody was using them. Nobody. Yeah, that's what uh, what I learned from Modular, from guys like Roger Lynn. That, and I believe me, I never used that stuff. Mm -hmm. I never used any of those things on the back. Uh, yeah. Probably, you know, most people with a CS80. How many people use that external input on the back? None. Nobody. Yeah. I wound up once I started putting two and two together. I, you know, I remember uh, at David's house at the Manor. Uh, you know, when I realized our VSO that we had. I was like, I asked our tech, I says, does this have a voltage control input? Voltage going. Yeah. You know what I mean? Once you start putting two and two together and you see uh, Korg had a tape delay, just like a, just like a uh, uh, Roland Space Echo. They had a tape delay that had a, a CV input. Yeah. You mean I could change the speed? With your keyboard. Remotely with or with a keyboard with a sequencer yeah. so that it was right in time. And if the tempo changed, I could still stay in time i started putting two and two together and got nuts got crazy with it the promise of voltage controlled uh yeah and the jacks jacks on the back of my of a jupiter to to take a uh, uh to have a drum machine going mm -hmm. and be able to tap in any pattern at all you know say on a cowbell is that the dirty laundry trick it's totally the dirty laundry so trick explain it's, the but yeah that was just all about gating i realized i could i could program any pattern i wanted Danny had a live organ, and they wanted this pattern, and they wanted it nailed. They had cut the track to a drum machine, and they wanted this organ part nailed. And uh, uh, I came in, and um, luckily Greg Ladani, thank you, Greg, he had recorded the Lynn sync tone, which most people didn't do in those yeah. days. So I was able to sync the drum machine back up. Um, I, I sank the drum machine back up. Um, but not to hear it. Oh, no. You're going to listen to the pattern coming off it. And I just on a cowbell programmed a ba ba da da da. Okay. That went to an envelope follower that triggered, that triggered two you know triggered envelopes, that and I then took the uh, the output the audio output of the Farfisa, just put it through a voltage controlled amplifier, and it was being controlled by that envelope. So all I was doing was just holding down hold notes the whole time and just very easy changing the chords and it just came out perfectly locked to the track. We put a little slap on it and they loved it. It's a hook beyond the singing and the parts. Yeah. It's a hook that makes it distinctive. Behind us is this big monster and it brings out a name to me that I want to talk about, Keith Emerson. Mm. God. Yeah, 1971, my first real rock concert at, mm. the, uh, uh, at the Hollywood Bowl. My brothers and all my brother's friends that, that they were in bands with, uh, we were all going to see Edgar Winter. That's who we were going to see. It was Edgar Winter's White Trash, an R&B band, an R&B horn band, uh, Humble Pie, 
And then this band, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, that had this song, Lucky Man. New song. Yeah. On the mm -hmm. radio. Uh, but before the show, all of a sudden, this low rumble came out of the speakers. And it did a slow glide up real high. And I just, my life was changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I literally said, what the fuck is that? And uh, Keith came out, did the Barbarian. You know, they opened with the Barbarian and, and uh, did Tarkus that night. And uh, my life was changed. There's yeah. something cool about the difference in the way people play keyboards. I was just talking to my friend Roger on one of these, and we mentioned that people were very pro keyboard. Like Keith Emerson was a very alpha male performer. Like he's really up there pounding and moving and jumping and twisting knobs and essentially the leader in a very strong three piece band. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Keith gets enough credit for the amazing stuff he did with the synth. You know, we all became friends later on in life, but uh, at the time, the more I talk to people, the more I hear about it was him. It wasn't other people programming these sounds. It was Keith, with whatever little knowledge he had, going for it. And, uh, um, and working with him, and again, I never knew him well until later years, but he didn't have a deep understanding of electronics no. like you and I maybe have developed, but he also intuitively knew what worked, and Bob Moog has been quoted as saying, he would find a weird way or a strange sound and then find a way to, oh, that's cool, let's make a piece around it or let's incorporate it sure into the did. music where it becomes a feature rather than trying to shape it into what I'm doing. And in your face, not, mm -hmm. there wasn't any, uh, uh, he was sure wasn't shy about it. Yeah, you know absolutely. What I mean? to, you know. 2015, the NAMM show, which is the musical convention in Anaheim, mm. All the makers of instruments, guitars, drums, trumpets, and synthesizers show off their wares. And this type of old technology was being brought back for the first time by the Moog mm. Synthesizer Company. Mm. Keith was invited to be the special guest in the booth and came over. And then he came out and started noodling. And you and I were there. I'll put up a picture of us mm -hmm. together, the three musketeers. <laughs> and it was quite a joy to be sitting there as he's playing his bits. You and I both know his vocabulary mm -hmm. and style so well that you're like adding some modulation and adjusting the filter here and, mm -hmm. and like working his instrument for him as he was playing. Just a lot of fun, but it was fun to be able to have us working together on this kind of instrument that we grew up with. Sure. Very cool. I've seen online there was a nice spit when he'd passed away you were on tour and you stopped to tell a nice piece. Yeah, yeah, I was in Japan and it just, uh, it was just shocking. It was just shocking. I, uh, I thought there was so much more to come. I wanted to see him sit at home and compose, you know, and uh, not worry about touring and the challenges of touring. And because uh, uh, I just Keith with all the all the rock star stuff and the the showmanship and all that. At the end of the day, it was Keith's notes mm. that affected me so deeply. You know, yeah. uh, I mean, sure, all of this stuff helped. And uh, uh, was, you know, it was amazing how we used keyboards live and how we used keyboards on records. But at the end of the day, it was his compositions. It was his notes, the, the, all that heroic stuff, you know, going to, going to battle, all, all that stuff that just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's funny you say going to battle because I remember having talks with him towards the end and he was not happy that his fingers didn't function Generally, yeah. the last two fingers on each hand were not working yeah. right. So he could hit octaves, but not really much more than three fingers per hand. And it was a thing that he tried to address medically, and it didn't quite work out. But the concept was, I sat around and talked to him, and I said, generals don't go out and fight a battle every year. They come and tell you about it, like a master class. And they show you the film, and they play you the recording, and they talk and tell an anecdote. And then you sit at the piano and play what you want to play, what you're capable of playing. So we had talked about him doing things in the future, and I think there were plans. I mean, there were definite plans to go on. His passing was an accident. He did intend to do other things. He wanted to do more stuff. So I wanted to see him write more and more concertos and just just write, but just write. I uh, I wish we could have heard that. That's a huge loss to all of us. A good friend of ours named Mark Bonilla, who's an amazing singer, player, arranger, producer, composer, uh, was with Keith for years and put together a wonderful tribute to him, which you are featured in. Uh, and you get to play some of Keith's parts. 
and I like it because it's a very aggressive, fun performance. But usually when you have a tribute to anybody, be it Bob Dylan or Hendrix or whoever, it's usually pretty poor. It makes you realize how good the original was. Mm -hmm. Sure. But these were some of the world's better musicians bringing their A game with full respect to this performance theater in L.A. And it's available on DVD now, possibly online. And absolutely great performances from everyone. I mean, you've got Luke from your band, Steve Luca, there's there. Mm -hmm. um, C.J. Vanston, who produces Toto Records now, an mm -hmm. incredible musician and a friend of Keith's. So many people showed up and brought their best that I actually recommend it either as an introduction to Keith Emerson's music or if you're a big fan, you will not be disappointed. Great stuff. Now, when Keith was uh, uh, talk about, you know, uh, I was always taught to be wary of meeting my heroes. and mm. uh, But boy, that was... He was my biggest one and uh, my biggest hero and, and just could not have been a sweeter guy. You know, yeah. could not have been a sweeter guy. Yeah, that's a nice surprise, isn't it? Good. Yeah, oh, especially someone like him and the mystique that I'd built up in my head about about this guy and going this waiting in line to see him play live every time they came in town. And, yeah. You know, it was uh, uh, a dream come true getting to meet him and then to be... I don't know, just uh, the friendship, you know. Not that we spent a whole lot of time with each other and, and, uh, or anything like that, but um, he just was always so sweet whenever we ran into each other. It's and great. I think there's mutual respect because he admires someone who's a musician, but also it's not just about playing. It's not just athletic pyrotechnics. It's anybody that doesn't write songs is going to have trouble. And mm. we wouldn't know about him if he was just a fantastic musician. Sure. You have to write those songs that, that do relate to people, and that's a big part of it. You, know. you mentioned Jeff before, and I wanted to say something, because you have a solo record that took most of your life to come <laughs> up with. <laughs> you know, it, like everyone's first solo it record. It to take a while. <laughs> but um, I was listening to it, and I guess what would be called side two on a CD, though. Uh -huh. And at one point I was like, damn, listen to that groove. And mm. I wasn't reading the liner notes. Oh, yeah. But it turned out to be a certain track on that record. Yeah, that was actually, uh, again, this is the good part of, of uh, uh, you know, us making, you know, uh, slave tapes, what we called slave tapes back in those days. And uh, a song back to you was something Toto tried to cut once. And uh, it didn't work out for the band. Um, it didn't work out. It was very much a synth-driven thing. And it just uh, um, never got finished and got shelved. And when I put together my solo album, here I had this complete drum track from my brother Jeff, then a complete bass track from my brother Mike. Amazing. And they were in my tape locker. And uh, No, it's just one of those things about uh, human personality. As you said, he wouldn't play the click track or something, but I find that with any distinctive musician, uh, the parts that stand out are the parts that people maybe relish the most. And when I hear a track like that, it was a little bit different than the rest of the record, but it had a kind of personality to that. It's a very unique, so, yeah. it was a very unique thing. And my brother, while he wouldn't, he really didn't want to know uh, about playing to a click with Toto, when it got to my own stuff, if it was something, and I was constantly writing and experimenting, and, and uh, uh, when it was the weekend, even after putting in a whole, you know, a whole a good week's work with the band or whatever, if I was trying something or experimenting or had written a tune, Jeff would come over and he'd play to any click track or play on any pads I asked him to. He was wide open when it wasn't officially Toto. I didn't know him personally, but I've heard stories about sessions where he was a jokester. Jeff? Yeah. And I think that's a characteristic of Steve Luke there. Luke? Oh, yeah. Various people that I admire and respect, Keith Emerson's one, who had a great sense of humor about things. Maybe not so worried about stuff, but at least had fun with it, if they were. Oh, yeah. Jeff, for sure. You know, Jeff's, Jeff's talent really kind of, I grew up with the guy. It really kind of came easily to him. I mean, all the, the, the wood shedding and digging in I saw him do growing up as a kid uh, uh, was 98% of it was him with headphones on with a turntable playing to great records, you know, mm. playing to records. He loved playing to records. That was kind of his education. I and uh, That's one of the things that makes a good writer is you read a lot of books or a good cook has to have tried a lot of different foods. Mm -hmm. And it, it allows you to take and choose what you want, even to hear something that you can't quite get there. 
and you struggle to go for it. There is a different world. I think it changed around... I'm trying to think of what would be the last band that grew up playing covers. Oh, Van Halen would be the one. Sure. They grew up playing covers. They were a non-original band. Sure. And then they mutated into playing originals. Nowadays, when people start a band, they usually... They might have spent some time learning records, but they would take time out, and now they write whatever their own music is. So maybe you're into big open chords. Maybe you're into jazz voicings. You don't stretch yourself That's as That's really interesting and true. I mean, I remember we lived. We lived for the dances we played at, the big gig, the prom, the homecoming coming up. And I know this was true of my brother Jeff, that his generation, he was just three years older than me, but uh, we all played in cover bands. We all played top 40 stuff. What kind of tunes? Oh, um, you know, originally their band, I mean, a lot of R&B, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, Memphis R&B, but uh, um, at one point in high school, uh, they just kind of, Jeff's heroes became, I'm seeing your Delaney and Bonnie records over there, oh, yeah. uh, you know, Jeff became obsessed with, with studio musicians that had great time as far as drummers go, Jim Gordon, Jim Keltner, these guys were his heroes. Uh, the only guy like in a rock band, you know, in rock bands that he admired were, of course, Ringo and and uh, uh, John Bonham, you know, was one of his hugest heroes. Incredible. And uh, yeah. so their high school band, it was they did the whole I don't know how familiar you are with Joe Cocker and Mad Dogs and Englishmen. They almost did that set verbatim. Oh, great. Great. They almost did that set verbatim. Leon Russell is always a huge hero of all of us. Uh, um so horn bands, you know what I mean? It was R and B stuff with horns, but it was also Joe Cocker. That that Mad Dogs and Englishmen set, which is great fun uh, live music. But in, in yeah. the way of the challenges, when I grew up, we did some cover band stuff, and and you know the people want to hear that song sound right. They don't want to hear you take it into a slow no. reggae version. They want no. you to get as close as possible, so you're stretching up to a absolutely. Absolutely. Maybe a style that's not yours. Or I remember once learning a ninth chord at the end of something. What is that? Whoa. And it's a ninth chord that ends a song. Sure. It's like, okay, now I know what that sound is. Yeah. But I might not have learned it in my own messing around, you know? We were fanatical about trying to recreate the record uh, uh, when we were kids. And I remember when my daughter, I, 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 my, young da my, my first daughter, Heather, my oldest girl, when she would um, have dances at school, I would always, I'd drop her off. But then I'd park my car, and I'd want to sneak my head in, mm -hmm. and not to embarrass her, but I wanted to see the band. Ah, oh, cool. You know, and every time it was a DJ. Oh. To speak to what you're talking about, though, where... Yeah. And I kind of saw that it was kind of with hip-hop music. Starting at the very beginning, no one really wanted to hear anybody cover hip-hop tunes. They kind of wanted to hear the record. Yeah, it was true. all about that record. Uh, um, you went from that world mm -hmm. into being in other people's groups. Yes. Like the Gary Wright thing. Yes. Which was a big pro keyboard, very, mm -hmm. maybe, well, I would call it early synthesizer for sure, compared to mm -hmm. what we've seen since then. And then uh, after that, Boss Gags, which is an incredible record and time period to be touring mm -hmm. for him. And then that group yep. became Toto. Mm -hmm. Lots of the backing people became a Toto thing. Mm -hmm. And then without jumping over those decades so quickly, music scoring and arranging mm -hmm. is a whole different field. It's related, but not. You know, there's, <laughs> there's something going on here that, that I think is interesting in your resume from first thing I heard was Dune. There's a total record for the first Dune film mm -hmm. by David Lynch, which is a great, great record. I really listened to it a lot. Yeah, we weren't at all ready for that. Uh, uh, we weren't at all ready for that. I wasn't ready to take advantage in of that. In what way, though? Well, you know, my dad being a musician and mostly doing, I mean, he did a lot of records and stuff like that, but he mostly did film stuff. He mostly was in the orchestra for for a lot of films, a lot of great films, a lot yeah. of great scores. And, um, you know, guys who compose for movies, these are, this was, we're talking Jerry Goldsmith, we're talking yeah. Jerry Fielding, Williams. we're talking John Williams, yeah. we're talking these guys that were on such a, a huge pedestal in our household and were so amazing. Uh, you know, I never thought in my wildest dream that I'd ever have a chance or an opportunity to score a film or to be in that world. It seems very imposing just to think about it, even to be responsible to an orchestra. 
mm -hmm. if you want to use an orchestra for sure. scoring. Sure, sure. I never had that. I didn't have that education. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that. Uh, uh, I never had perfect pitch. I couldn't, if there was a wrong note out there, I couldn't just look at a score and figure it out. I'd have to sit there at the piano and, you know, I, that was something I, I never thought I'd have a chance to do. And, uh, uh, yeah, it wasn't until, and believe me, guys like, uh, guys like Danny Elfman, guys like Hans Zimmer, I think, you know, they, they got a hard time. They had a hard time from a lot of the, the music establishment at yeah. first. Mm. You know, I think that was part of uh, in the interviews I've read. That's part of what what drove Danny Elfman was the was the disrespect he got, uh, um, you know, even. Um, but it didn't stop them and it didn't stop. And those guys kind of showed all of us that, you know what, it's possible. There's a close parallel in a friend of yours, James Newton Howard, who mm -hmm. is crazy, incredible talent. But I first knew of him through Elton John's records. Yep. Great work on there, Rock of the Westies record especially, is so good, and yet moved on quickly to being one of the biggest scoring people around. Yeah. Did you learn from him? Was he an inspiration? Or? Absolutely. He was the biggest inspiration. Oh. You know, James was always a hero. James did all the string arrangements on Toto 4 mm -hmm. and subsequent Toto albums. Uh, uh, we were all big James fans. You know, he had taken over for Paul Buckmaster, who we had on such a pedestal as far as string arranging goes, uh, uh, what he did on those early Elton John albums. And James kind of took over. And was his keyboard player live on the road, you yeah. know, doing the synths, had a great knowledge of synthesizers and, and knew, how to, knew how to use them, you know. There's a corner of the world I haven't thought of in a while. Um, Sheffield Labs was a company yeah. that made very high quality vinyl records. And they cut things live to disc, which is now a thing again. Vinyl is back. And some people who indulge that are like, no, we can record live to the record. That's pretty hip. You made a record with James called James Newton Howard and Friends. Yes. And it's a version of Toto plus him doing instrumental pieces. But it was based on a NAM show performance yeah. or something? We had, uh, uh, um, I developed this great relationship with Yamaha, starting with the CS80. I, uh, my brother Mike bought one and in, in, there was a big waiting list in LA to get a CS80. It was, uh, they weren't going to be available for months. And my brother Mike happened to be in Japan touring with Larry Carlton. And he said, Steve, they're on every corner here. Every music store has got several of them. Should I grab you one? And I was like, absolutely. Right. And that was kind of my first synth with Toto. That was kind of what I was bringing to the table for the very first Toto album. I was going to have this new polyphonic synth that really felt like a polyphonic Moog to me as opposed to a poly Moog and yeah. anything else available at the time. And it had this individual aftertouch and it just sounded so human and so cool. And I, I, it really became my ax, you know, if, if a synth guy can have an ax, mm. um, I loved it. And, uh, right away it started screwing up, you uh -huh. know, uh, uh, there started being problems with it. And I called Yamaha. I, it was uh, what was then. It was just the dealer service. They did not do consumers. They didn't okay. do customers. They just were a dealer service thing. And they says they blew me off. They said you've got to bring it to Valley Sound at the time, your local yeah, sure. factory authorized dealer. I I brought it in. When I picked it up, there were five more things wrong. Not only didn't they fix what oh, was no. wrong with it, <laughs> there were five more things wrong with it just by them screwing around in there. That's a problematic beast for sure. Yep. I called them back. I was very persistent in those days. Called them back, and they said, look, we'll, uh, uh, we'll get it working perfectly for you, and then you're on your own. Okay. And I says, great. That's very generous. You know, that's, that's fine. Um, so I drove all the way out there, dropped it off. There was a guy named Jim Smerdell, a technician. And uh, anyway, I kept on. He would fix it, but within a week, there'd be something else. And I just, this wound up being, uh, starting a huge relationship. Jim and I, you know what I mean? He wound up getting to know me very well. And the fact that I would drive it out there. And at least because you're relying on it as your main tool, yes. uh, you're developing a relationship with the instrument as well as the yes. company. Yes, this was my baby. And they were very impressed with how well I got to know the instrument and how I could show them. It was never, well, it's kind of not working. I could show them yeah. exactly what was wrong with it and recreate the problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, 
they're kind of they built up a respect for me and uh and the instrument was so problematic we got to know each other very well uh i started making some some suggestions for modifications did you that... get your own parking space down there <laughs> <laughs> that would have been good very very close anyway they uh um they started an artist program you know in the early 80s and uh and jim smardell says you'd be perfect for you know this artist program as far as them taking care of me and endorsing and and Toto was kind of blowing up. Toto's first album had come out and did real well. My buddy Roger Lynn had just finished his LM1, was just kind of coming out and uh, uh, I'd gotten this idea to do a, a, to help to demonstrate Yamaha keyboards to do a one man band thing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, um, I never thought in a million years, you know, doing direct to disc records. Those are for just like great artists, great piano players. It was one pass. You had to do the whole side of the album live. Yeah, if there's if there's three seconds between songs, you have to wait three seconds. Exactly. If there's a fade out, it has to be done live and then reset the levels two seconds later. Yes. Yeah. Now maybe James, David Page, my brother Jeff, these guys are are great musicians. Uh, I'm Mr behind the scenes, Mr. Overdub. Okay. Uh, I needed lots of tracks to do what I do. Yeah. Uh, um, anyway, Bill Schnee, who was very much connected with this company that was producing these records, he came and saw one of our shows and the band was, it was myself, David Page, James Newton Howard, very close friend. And uh, initially we did it with, a, with an LM1, with Roger's drum machine, but then later my brother Jeff would join us and even sometimes Nathan East on bass or, uh, uh, something like that anyway bill came and saw us at an am show doing this stuff live you know with all these with all these yamaha keyboards and uh he brought doug Sachs, his partner in this endeavor and uh to see us live and they thought we'd be perfect to do a direct to disc record so i got to i got to be on a direct to disc record it's a little challenging yeah it was very uh um Stretched up, stretched the nerves quite a bit, but uh, yeah. But it's also a time too that it was uh, a brand new instrument had come out or was coming out that you guys were featuring the Yamaha DX7, which is an icon of the industry. Mm -hmm. Was unavailable, was expensive, was hard to get, but it was totally the revolution of digital yep. instruments coming true. Yeah, there were attempts at it. Yep, uh, we mentioned like expensive Sinclaviers and things with hundred thousand sure. dollar instrument, but here's a. We did it a year before. We did it years before with the GS1, which was yeah. a, a $16,000 instrument that was non-programmable. Yeah, that has little cards that go into it. Yeah, and, little... But it is digital yep. marimbas and strings and It sounded whatever. amazing. Right. It sounded amazing. It looks like a piano, though, or an organ. It it's sure not did. a little modern it was keyboard. 88 notes. It was uh, beautiful. That's I think that's kind of the Japanese thing, though. They're going for the market. If they want to sell yeah. it, not to rock stars. Yeah. But they want everybody to buy it for their home. It's the new organ, mm -hmm. which they've always been great with organs all the time. Yeah. Still making them. But that did lead to the DX7, you know, us, us demonstrating the uh, DX7s when they were first released. Uh, the Yamaha CS80 you mentioned reminds me, uh, the very first time I think you and I met, I was at the Mokes and Sizer booth, and they had made this thing called the Voyager. And you asked me, can it do a blip? <laughs> and the blip is a, your term for something we discussed earlier, the attack of a sound. Yes, the complicated attack. I, when I first got my modular stuff, um, right before I got it, Frank Zappa had an album, Shake Your Booty. And there was a tune on there called Yo Mama. Mm -hmm. And there's a synth break. Uh, there's a synth break on it. And it's amazing. Compositionally, since the sounds, uh, uh, the sounds are amazing. And I played it for Roger Lynn. I said, how do I get that sound? Yeah. And Roger knew immediately what it was. He said, uh, uh, that's a, you've got to blip one of the oscillators. You've got to have a, an extra envelope. Um, and so technically, this is more of a pitch change mm -hmm. that happens really quick. Just on the attack. And trumpets, I'm told, yes. have a kind of acceleration. So when you hit a note, it's it it accelerates up into the note. If you're looking at a frequency chart, it doesn't just start on G like an organ or a piano. It rises up quickly. Yes. Almost instantaneously. Yes. Now, this is something you couldn't do on a Moog. And the other yeah. thing about it was that 
you could only you do it only on one of the oscillators, one of two oscillators. Mm -hmm. So there's the that comes rub. On note, the other one comes up. So there's that rub. Yeah. The one is just kind of blipped out of tune just for a second. Yeah. Roger pointed it out to me what to do. And then we wound up really uh, uh, making it more sophisticated, if I can geek out for just a second. Yeah. We do not only the blip like that with an envelope, but another thing that you really needed, and to this day, for the most part, you still need mm. a modular synth to do, is to take a very fast LFO mm -hmm. about the speed of someone Tell doing you. a raspberry, you know, yeah. spitting, you know, uh, an LFO going about that fast, and uh, you need to gate that LFO. Start and stop. You know, yep. with an envelope. Yep. With an envelope, and then you send that to the filter. Just on the attack. So okay. it's just on the attack, and then it goes away. Wow. You know, you could also put that on one of the oscillators, and it just adds shit to the attack. Yeah, you know, it does. just makes the attack more and more complicated. But Roger showed me that, so I did it right away on, uh, on my Polyfusion stuff. And, uh, um, yeah, that wound up being a big part of my sound, and uh, I, I still go to it. It is a thing that is iconic to those records you made. And also, I've seen people since then, you've probably seen it, synthesizers that say Toto Horns. And you know what that means when you hear it. Mm -hmm. It's not going for a perfect replication. It's going for the synth sounds you made that have that attack to the front. So I got to give credit to, and by the way, Frank Zappa had this amazing synth that it was, was emu. It was it was starting with a CS80, mm. okay, which was this weird linear organ technology, yeah. okay, that was not, they didn't have a bunch of CV and gate outs. Mm -hmm. It was this very proprietary so uh, yeah. organ tech, not kind of technology that wasn't, that didn't interface real well. There was a CV in that you could assign to everything, uh, you know, to the oscillators or the filter or the amplifier. But um, I'm sorry I forget his name. Keith Olson, the great engineer, was an assistant of his, and he modified this CS80 so that it played an emu modular. That's it. Okay. Okay. Which I've seen pictures of the giant emu system. Okay. Yeah. Being played from a CS80, multi and it was multi-voices. Multi-voices and. Uh, the guy who programmed that and played that, I think, on your mom and stuff is Tommy Mars. And, oh, great. Uh, uh, the great Tommy Mars. So I got to give credit so to all of this. This is all kind of from Tommy Mars. And I remember one time Toto was getting ready to go on the road. We're at Leeds and we're all set up. And I had my modular stuff all set up. And Tommy came in and he, yeah. he looked very closely at my patch. Oh. And he gave me the big thumbs up. It was, uh, a, Good. It was a proud moment. You know. I have to laugh. Tommy's such a character, not just yes. in a player, but a human character. Yes. Don't know him, but I remember seeing him once play on stage, and his keyboard stand was an ironing board. <laughs> and that's just his personality, sure. to a T. Sure. Um, speaking of keyboard stands, you may not even know this. There is the Toto 4 album, has pictures of you guys. Mm -hmm. You've got a little rig of keyboards and stuff there. Mm. I was given that keyboard stand years ago. You're kidding. Um, which is custom-made set of pipes, almost. And it had a rack of stuff going up on it. Sure. It, it was just pictured on the record. Sure. No, we were able to, Page had an A100 Hammond, and it was made so that you could put a CS80. Heavy? Very heavy, 250 yeah. somewhat pounds, probably as, almost as heavy as the Hammond. Yeah. You know? And then we'd put a, uh, a Jupiter or a, or a Prophet 5 above that. Stacking things Probably up. a potent rig there. It, th there's a change now between seeing those people, and that was a... I would call it a good size, but a medium size rig compared to some people. Some people had more. Rick Wakeman, for example, etc. But there's something fun about watching people. Oh, he's going over there to make that sound. That's an organ. Yep. She's going over here to play piano. That's her piano. Oh, now she's playing the strings on that one, and you've got your hands split and you're doing yep. the dance. I did see a, a Yes concert a few years ago that just had two keyboards, and somebody was switching it off stage with a laptop probably and it was so boring <laughs> yeah no i i wound up there i kind of had done the it happens i yeah. kind of had done the you know what i mean the multi keyboard synth modular on the road yeah. uh, uh it all looked great uh um i kind of did that and and uh for anybody out there who knows what main stage is it's yeah. kind of uh it's taken over I wanted to be more really as efficient as I could be and uh, with two keyboards 
and just really splitting things, using the promise of MIDI, uh, being able to have a pedal scale differently, going to several different things at once. Uh, it kind of does all that. The and difference so, being that sounds can be much more accurate now. You can actually yes. have splits and things that follow your hands and you get polyphonic aftertouch on any instrument. If I you can want. use the very, you know, I was able to start using the very sounds that I used on the rec, you know, on the, on the later records, you know. Um, you mentioned this modular synthesizer system, which is a company called Polyfusion. Mm -hmm. Not so well known, but good quality. And you and I have been talking yes. to them about helping yes. them get things going. Yeah. They've been great to me. They, they found us. It was kind of, uh, you know, I always wanted, a Moog was always the Rolls Royce to me. But you had these giant systems that when nobody was doing it anymore, you were taking them on the road to be able to do things live. That's challenging. Yep. Yep, I was doing my blip stuff live. I was doing my lead, big lead voice for some of the solo stuff. And then like in the Rosanna solo, there's, uh, um, actually on the record, I think I used Jupiter 8, my Jupiter 8 for those three things, but live, uh, and I had the micro composer live. So I would, I would kick, kick it on with my, with trigger a foot, thing. Yeah. trigger it with a foot pedal. Um, it was able to do all these different sounds at the same time. That was the thing is that I didn't, the reason why my rigs were, the rigs were so big, and we actually had it, we had two of them, still do, as a matter of fact, but it, it wasn't for, uh, I wished it was for more for processing and, and, and doing things that uh, only a synthesizer could do. For the most part, initially, anyway, it was just about voices. Mm -hmm. In those days, besides an expander module, I wanted something that was, more sophisticated than that. And essentially, what Roger Lynn designed for me was eight Minimogs rack mounted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was eight Minimogs rack mounted. That's kind of what I wanted at first. It wasn't until later until Polyfusion started giving me sequencers and, and uh, uh, quadrature oscillators and, and Ralph Dyke would design lag filters for me and, right. and custom stuff like that. Then yeah, I started getting into this the real synthesis of it all. A real interesting time period because these kinds of instruments is a way of working. Many people are very comfortable with it now. In fact, I, I know stores full of these instruments now where it is the a certain way to approach performance and sound design, which is really powerful. I mean, you're building from core colors here. You've got primary colors and things like that, but you're mm. literally building your instrument each time you plug it in. Each yeah. person has their own taste in that. So. I'm fascinated by the technology coming around. And when Bob Moog and I would walk through the NAMM show, we saw a few people, company MOTM. Uh, there were a few other beginning companies that were starting to make these again. And Bob was just shaking his head going, wow. And he said, we don't usually see technology march backward. Mm, Nobody wants an old TV, an old blender, no. an old you know refrigerator. No. So there's a musical trend, but not on the technology side until then. And he was just going, it's so weird. We we kind of failed at that back then. I mean, they made it. They made the instruments. Right. But it wasn't financially strong. No. And here are these people doing it again. Of course. Or to even fake a sound in here. I just love the physicality of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's nothing like dialing in with real size knobs and and uh, dialing in a sound. It's, uh, it's a unique experience. You gave your instruments uh, Roman, Greek names? You know, that was just for the, you know, I was still doing a lot of sessions and I wouldn't always need all of it. So we just kind of uh, gave everything names sometimes just so the cartridge company would know. Ah. Just bring Ramsey's and they okay. would know just to bring which cabinet to bring, <laughs> you know, then trying to explain. I guess it's like it a a number. B.B. King with Lucille. You know, sure, with bring Lucille as opposed to. And it gives to, us uh, some personality too. That's yeah. good. Yeah, it was just fun. Um, we've had a great talk. We might do more in the future. Sure, anytime. And think of things to think about. and uh, Anytime. What a great we'll, setup. We'll plug coming. that in and just make noise with it someday. That'll be fun, too. We can run a camera on that. That'd be great. Thank you for coming. Let's do it again. Absolutely. We'll see Pleasure. you next time.